Beyond the Prisoner's Dilemma by Dylan Watt. The Prisoner's Dilemma is a thought experiment initially posed by Merrill Flood and Melvin Drescher, who were both mathematicians. The name and interpretation of The Prisoner's Dilemma was actually coined by Albert Tucker. The story is this. Two men commit a felony together and are both convicted. They are both given an offer independently. If they throw their partner under the bus, they can walk out a three, free man, but their partner will get three years in prison. If they both tell on each other, then they both get two years in prison. If they both stay silent, they each only get one year in prison. Each prisoner has no idea what the other will choose. It is a game of trust, deception, strategy, and self-preservation. A variation of the prisoner's dilemma was posed by Robert Axelrod. He invited a number of game theorists to submit strategies for the prisoner's dilemma if it was played multiple times in a row. He programmed computers to play these games against each other, with each strategy being determined in advance. Instead of prison sentences, points were used. The issue with the always cooperating strategy is that while it does really well when playing against an opponent with the same strategy, it will always fail when up against an opponent using the always deflect method. The always deflecting method is similarly flawed. While it is the safest strategy, it is also not the fastest strategy and won't gain as many points. And the winner of Axelrod's tournament was the tit for tat strategy. The tit for tat strategy is as follows. The program always chooses to cooperate the first game, but after that, it does whatever the opponent chose in the first round. So if the opponent cooperated first, the program will always cooperate. If the opponent defected first, the program will always defect. Another strategy to come of this is called the tit for two tat strategy. In this strategy, the program will always cooperate unless the opponent defects twice in a row, in which case the program will defect once and then return to cooperation regardless of what the opponent picks. This is often referred to as the nicer strategy, given the fact that it will always cooperate unless its opponent betrays twice in a row. A similar, less forgiving strategy also exists, known as the two tits for tat strategy. In this strategy, every defect of the opponent is punished by two defects of the user regardless of what the opponent chose. Unfortunately, there really is no right way to solve the prisoner's dilemma because each strategy can excel or crash based off of what the opponent chooses. Every time Axelrod thought that he found the winning strategy, it would always inevitably lose eventually when paired against programs with randomly selected strategies. As an avid video gamer and an enjoyer of ethical themes, I was instantly drawn to a game series called Zero Escape. There are three entries in the series, and each deal with philosophical issues caused when people are kidnapped and have to use each other to escape. The game in the series I will be focusing on is called Virtue's Last Reward, and it's the second game in the series. The game begins with the player character, Sigma, waking up in an empty warehouse. He soon discovers he is not alone. He is joined by Mysterious Phi, Gruff Ten Miyoji, Calculating Alice, Innocent Clover, Amnesiac K, Selfless Luna, Childish Quark, and Selfish Dio. All of them are wearing bracelets that show the number three. They are told by an anthropomorphic rabbit hologram known as Zero the Third that the only way they can leave the warehouse is getting their bracelet number up to nine. Now, you might be wondering how the prisoner's dilemma comes into play. Everyone is separated into six groups, three of which consist of one person, and three of which consist of two people. Then each set of two is paired with one of the solo groups, making three big groups in total. The pair enter one room together, and the solo person enters an adjacent room. Once inside, they are given a simple choice. You can choose to ally with your partner, or betray them. They have no idea of what you will pick, and you have no idea what they will pick. If you choose to ally with your partner, and they choose to ally as well, you both gain two points. If you choose to betray them, and they choose to ally, you gain three points, but they lose two points. 
If you choose to ally and they choose to betray, then you lose two points and they gain three. Lastly, if you both choose to betray, then you both don't gain or lose any points. Remember, once a player gets to nine points, they can activate the gate to leave the room. But there's a catch. The door can only open once. Once one person leaves through the door, nobody else can escape and they will all eventually rot away and die. As you can see, it is impossible to get to nine points with just one round. That means the round needs to play multiple times, similar to the contest. The fact that the game can be played multiple times allows us to expand on the topic of the prisoner's dilemma. After you were done voting, you were all forced to look at what each person chose and how it affected their scores. Would you still pick betray if you had to look the person you betrayed right in the eyes when you were done? You don't keep the same partner throughout the game. When the next round is played, the pair and solo teams are shuffled up. Would what someone voted before determine whether you would ally against them or betray? If somebody picked betray the previous round, are you going to choose to betray them to save yourself? If somebody picked ally before, are you going to take advantage and pick betray? To expand upon that point, I want to introduce two characters, Luna, who will always choose ally, and Dio, who will always choose betray. You know that Luna will always pick ally, so will you also ally so that you both gain two points? Or will you betray her so you can get that one extra point, but she'll lose two? What about Dio? Is it ethical to betray him, even if you know he will betray you as well? If you both betray, neither of you gain or lose anything. But if you ally and he betrays, you lose two and he gains three. Let's throw another wrench into the situation. If your bracelet number reaches zero, you die. Now, let's say you are playing against someone who has a score of one. In this case, betraying them, if they ally, doesn't result in the loss of a few points. It results in them having a score of negative one, less than zero. It results in death. Would you choose to betray someone if you knew it would kill them? How about another scenario? What if you have six points and they have one? There's only three more points until you can get to nine and escape. You can do that if you pick betray and they pick ally. If that happens, then you can win your freedom, but it's in exchange for someone else's death. These are questions that the initial prisoner's dilemma doesn't ask. Ten years in prison is one thing, but a life is another. Would you send somebody to prison for ten years in exchange for your freedom? Maybe. Would you exchange your freedom for someone else's life? Maybe there's a different answer. In this game, you, the player, must make these choices. No one is making them for you. Will you hit betray just to see what will happen? Or will you try to be the good Samaritan and ally every time? You also have to witness the consequences of your actions. Choose to betray someone and that results in their death. You have to watch them die. The characters you've grown to love dying before your eyes. The decisions you make also have major impacts on how the story proceeds. Here is a full list of all the possible routes and endings. In order to get the true ending, you have to go through all other endings first. That means in order to win, you have to betray the characters you love. And in doing so, they could even die. You must betray if you want to win. Let's introduce yet another scenario. If one of the characters does not show up in time for voting, their vote will automatically set to ally. Is it unethical to betray someone who is not even there? This scenario introduces a far more sinister implication. There's time between the rounds in the game, enough time to dispose of someone. If you kill someone, you are guaranteeing that you can gain three points because their vote will automatically default to ally. Is that any less ethical than the scenario in which someone dies because you drop their points to below zero? One of the most difficult parts of this game is that the characters are made with so much personality. Is it ethically okay to ally against one character but betray another based off of how likable you find them? Let's take Quark for instance. Quark is just a little boy who hides snacks in his hat. He has his whole life ahead of him. 
is it okay to betray him? What about his grandfather, Tenmyoji? Is it okay to betray him just because he's older? Or would you pity him and choose ally? Let's take Clover now. She has everything going for her, so would you even have sympathy? Or would you willingly cut down a girl who is in the prime of her life and has her whole career ahead of her? What good she, could she do for society if she was able to leave? Now, let's say you find it unethical to betray any of these characters so far. How about Dio, then? He's in his 30s, not too young, not too old, no disabilities, no abnormalities. The only thing remarkable about him is his absolutely horrendous attitude. Is it okay to betray him? Is it okay to choose who is off limits and who is not based off of personality alone? As you can see, the multiple rounds combined with the points system creates so many more scenarios for the prisoner's dilemma. Virtue's Last Reward is truly a game that takes a relatively simple concept and just runs with it, truly taking us beyond the prisoner's dilemma.